Jenny, Ron, beloved friends, thank you so much. Thank you, Ron, for that introduction. In case people don't fully realize what Baron Zacks of Aldgate means, Aldgate is our equivalent of the Lower East Side in New York. <laughs> that is Yichus. <laughs> friends, I can't tell you how thrilled Elena and I are to be in Dallas for the first time in our lives. But what we want to know is, what did you do with JR? <laughs> I think we'll just have to settle for our own JR Jewish renewal. Friends, it is a humbling privilege to be able to join you in uh, paying tribute to Jenny and Ron's incredible work here in totally revitalizing and transforming Jewish life here in Dallas. As there is simply, well, you've heard it all, there's almost no element of Jewish education to which Janie has not made a transformative contribution. And uh, Mort was right, Janie, it's scary, but it's also inspirational. And you've been incredible. And as for you, Ron, all that you've done here, and especially in uh, West Galil, has also been nothing short of remarkable. I uh, want, if I may, just to pay tribute because it's the first time we've had the privilege of meeting them to the people who have clearly been Janie's inspiration, her wonderful parents, Leslie and Howard. Truly, Dallas is blessed by you both. And how beautiful, Janie and Ron, to see your own lovely children being inspired by you as you were by your parents. I say to you all, Ashreham Shekachalo, happy is the people that has people like these. The Mesopotamians built ziggurats. The Egyptians built pyramids. The Greeks built the Acropolis. The Romans built the Colosseum. Jews built schools. And because of that, all those ancient civilizations are no more, but Judaism and the Jewish people are still alive and well and young. We became the only people in history to predicate our very survival on learning, and Jews became the people whose citadels are schools and houses of study, whose heroes are teachers, and whose passion is education and the life of the mind. Wherever in history. Jewish education has been strong. Jewish life has been strong. You've done wonderful things. May you continue to set your sights higher. May God bless all of you, and may you continue to bless the Jewish people. Amen. Friends, I'm just walking here to check whether my microphone is working, and uh, introduce a little excitement into what is undoubtedly going to be a totally boring lecture. But I was asked to say a few words about my new book, The Great Partnership, which is about God's science and the search for meaning. And uh, because I uh, was once in my life trained as a philosopher, and because through Hong Kong Jewish community we have some contacts with China, I was always enthralled by the story of the English philosophy professor who was invited to give a lecture on philosophy in the University of Beijing. Not being able to speak Mandarin, uh, the Chinese provided an interpreter for him. Well, the elective professor began his lecture, stopped after two sentences for the translator to translate. But the Chinese translator waved him on and said, you carry on, I'll tell you when I need you to stop. He carried, the professor carried on for 15 minutes. The interpreter asked him to pause and said four words in Chinese. <laughs> the same thing happened after 30 minutes, the same thing after 45 minutes, and at the end of an hour's lecture, the interpreter said three words, and everyone stood up and politely filed out. The professor wanted to know. He said, I have given an extraordinarily intricate and complicated philosophy lecture. How were you able to summarize it in so few words? 
Simple, said the interpreter. After 15 minutes, I said, so far, he hasn't said anything new. <laughs> After 30 minutes, I said, he still hasn't said anything new. After 45 minutes, I said, I don't think he's going to say anything new. And after an hour, I said, I was right, he didn't. So, <laughs> it is a little challenging to try and say something new on a subject which has aroused in recent years in Britain and America such heated debate. The whole new atheism which has been, as you know, set out by in Britain Richard Dawkins, in America Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, the late Christopher Hitchens, the old science and religion debate on which hundreds of books have been written. The reason I wrote The Great Partnership is very simple, because I was picking up that a lot of young Jews were being influenced by this new and rather aggressive atheism, and they were having all sorts of problems with their faith and we had to do something about it. But there was another reason, and that is this. It became clear to me that this kind of atheism was a real problem for a certain type of Christianity. But it seemed to me that this kind of challenge from science wasn't a problem for Judaism at all. Jews have never been afraid of science. In fact, we see science and religion not as enemies, but as friends. As Einstein said, religion without science is blind, science without religion is lame. We see them as very much walking hand in hand. In fact, 2,000 years ago, I want you to reflect on this, 2,000 years ago, our sages coined a bracha, a blessing, to be said over seeing a non-Jewish scientist. Hashem Natan Mechokmato Adam, who gave of his wisdom to flesh and blood. I have made it over several Nobel Prize winners. Now, work out who were those non Jewish scientists. Who were they? They were either Greeks or they were Romans. Now, go figure. The Greeks banned the public practice of Judaism, which is why we have Hanukkah. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem, burned the temple, sent Jews into an exile that lasted 2,000 years. The rabbis had no reason to like Romans or Greeks, and yet so impressed were they by science that they said, well, forget all the rest. For your science, we will thank God for you and make a blessing over you. And that strikes me as open-mindedness of intellectual confidence an openness that is absolutely extraordinary. So I want this evening to invite you to come with me on a voyage of discovery as to why Jews don't find a problem with science, but some other religions do. It's a fascinating story, and it begins with the ancient Greeks. Ancient Greece, the Greece of Athens, was one of the greatest civilizations the world has ever known. The Athens of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, of Aeschylus and Sophocles, historians like Herodotus and Thucydides, and it was a remarkable culture. Greece produced the world's first scientists, the world's first philosophers. They produced, I don't know if you thought about this, the Greeks were a visual culture. What were they great at? Art, architecture, things you watch, theater, the Olympic Games. We didn't invent the Olympic Games. Uh, we didn't even win any, a lot of medals this time, so forget the Olympic Games. Anyway, so the Greeks were fascinated. They were a visual culture. They were the cu a culture of the eye. And this, and they saw knowledge as a kind of seeing. And that metaphor has lived with us for two and a half thousand years to today. When we talk about somebody of understanding, we talk about foresight, insight, hindsight. Somebody makes an observation. Somebody adopts a perspective. Uh, somebody has a visionary mind. When you understand something, what do you say? I see. All of that is due to the Greeks, whereas Jews were completely different. We weren't all that keen on visual images. We were a 
we didn't really develop art. Jews were a culture and still are of the ear rather than the eye. Do you know what the Talmud, Babylonian Talmud uses to talk about understanding? Tashma, Kamashmala, Shmamina, Lo all variants of Shma, which means to hear. They are all metaphors of hearing. In fact, Sigmund Freud, even though he was very hostile to Judaism, invented psychoanalysis, and psychoanalysis was originally called the speaking cure, but actually psychoanalysis is the listening cure. Of course, all the early psychoanalysts except Jung were Jewish. But then who is not Jewish who actually needs psychoanalysis? <laughs> It's very interesting. I don't know if you ever thought about this. It was only after Jews brought psychoanalysis and psychotherapy to America, they brought it to America. Only then did people begin to say, I hear you. That's entirely due to the Jewish influence of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. And so you have these two completely different cultures. And Western civilization was born in the synthesis between Greek philosophy and science and Jewish spirituality called Christianity. But I want now, and this was one of my major discoveries in the book, to point to something which is absolutely crucial, but virtually no one talks about, nobody talks about, and it is this. The founder of Christianity was a Jew who lived in Israel, who read the Bible in Hebrew, and who spoke Aramaic. But all the early Christian texts, without exception, are written in what language? Greek. All of them. The early Christians even read the Hebrew Bible in Greek in the translation called the Septuagint. The result was that all the religious ideas introduced into the West by Christianity entered the West in translation. And there are some words you can't translate. You know, uh, Ron was kind enough to mention that I wanted something called the Jerusalem Prize. It's a wonderful prize to win because you get it in Jerusalem on Yom Yerushalayim, and it's given to you by the President of the State of Israel. So, uh, when I received it, the president of the State of Israel was the late Asa Weizmann, and my parents were there. Why do we do anything except to give nachas to our parents? And Asa Weizmann spoke in Ivrit, and luckily, Baruch Hashem, my parents didn't understand Ivrit. <laughs> because what he said was, I see Rabbi Sachs has been given his award for religious education in the diaspora. Well, he said, religious education is better than nothing, but... And then proceeded to give a long diatribe about how what we really need is secular Jewish schools. I came back to England, and the next time I saw the Israeli ambassador, I said, Kavod HaShagri, and now I know why after 4,000 years, the Hebrew language does not contain a word that means tact. <laughs> and it doesn't. You ask in Israeli, how do you say tact in, in Hebrew? Be free, tact, say tact. They have to use the English word. So not all words are translatable. And I want to give you a, a, a basic example here. The word, the concept of knowledge. The concept of knowledge in Greece meant, for Greece, knowledge was something you achieved by reason, by observation, by philosophy, by science, which you acquired by being detached. Scientific detachment, philosophical detachment. Knowledge is cognitive, it's detached, it's impersonal. That's the way a scientist knows something. Now in Hebrew, what does knowledge mean, da'at? And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she became pregnant. I mean, I hope I don't need to explain. You don't achieve that by detached observation. <laughs> Dart in that f case means intimacy. That's what it means. 
God says about Abraham, Ki yedativ, I have known him so that he will teach his children to follow in the way of the Lord. The word know it there means, what does it mean? I love him, I choose him. The Israelites are suffering in Egypt. Vayeda Elohim. And God knew. It doesn't mean he knew it as a fact. It means, as Rashi says, he was moved to compassion. So the very concept of knowledge in ancient Israel and ancient Greece was completely different. In Judaism, knowledge isn't detachment, it's attachment. It isn't impersonal, it's deeply personal. And that is how misunderstanding arose in the West for 2,000 years, because they only ever got Jewish ideas in translation, and you can't translate the basic concept of knowledge. Now let me give you the biggest mistranslation of the lot. And here it is. Moses meets God in the burning bush. And he says, who are you? And God replies in three famous words, Ehiyeh, Asher, Ehiyeh. Now until very recently, all non-Jewish Bible translations translated those words as, I am that I am. I am what I am. I am who I am. Or my favorite, I am. That's who I am. <laughs> now, every single Jewish child who ever went to Cheder knows that that is a mistranslation. What is a yeah, a yeah, yeah? I will be what I will be. God's name in Hebrew is the future tense. Now, how did the Greeks understand God, who defines himself as, I am that I am? They understood God as the ground of being, the first cause, the unmoved mover, necessary being, the I am of existence. And that is the way you think of God if you are a scientist. What Yehuda Halevi called the God of Aristotle, this abstract God who is the ground of being. But Jews knew God, who defined himself as, I will be what I choose to be, meaning they knew him as the God of history, who intervened in history to liberate his people from slavery, the God who created us in love, the God who lifts us when we fall, who forgives us when we fail. That is God, not as ground of being. That is God as parent. That's what we think of him as. Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king. God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh, in my name, Bani, Bechori Yisrael, my child, my firstborn Israel. That's how we think of him. God is, for us, God is somebody who connects with us. Where we are, there God will be. In fact, I love the comment of a Jewish mother who said, now I have children, I find I can relate to God much better. Now I know what it is to create something you can't control. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. You know, Stephen Hawking wrote a book called A Brief History of Time, and in the last chapter he said, if we can finally arrive at a unified field theory combining all the physics and the cosmology, we will know the mind of God. And I said, Stephen, you don't need unified field theory. You just need to be a Jewish parent. <laughs> now that is the God of Abraham, not the God of Aristotle. That kind of God has nothing to do with science and everything to do with the ability to bring new life into being through an act of love and care for that being and help it grow and forgive it when it falls and when it fails. And that is the great difference. Now came the inspiration, and the, the, now working on a completely non Jewish concept of God. Along comes the inspiration for all the new atheists, who is Charles Darwin, right? Charles Darwin, the, uh, the, the origin and the inspiration of our new atheists. Um, in fact, you know, when it comes to Yidden, we do a pretty good line in Apikorosim ourselves. Um, 
I don't know if you ever thought about this, three of the four great uh, heretics of the modern world were Jewish, Spinoza, Marx, and Freud. The only one who wasn't Jewish was Darwin. Why Darwin wasn't Jewish, I have no idea. <laughs> he had a long beard, he was a total apicarus, he had every qualification. How was Darwin not Jewish? I don't know. Must have been a random genetic mutation. Hebra. Why did Charles Darwin become an atheist? Let me explain to you historically. Charles Darwin became an atheist because as a young man, he read a book of Christian theology called Natural Theology, written by, published by somebody called William Paley in 1802. It's a famous book in it. Paley says, if you're walking in the middle of a desert and you find a watch, then you know somebody made that watch. It didn't just grow there. It didn't just happen. Why? Because it is, has a design and therefore has a designer. That's what Charles Darwin grew up with. And Charles Darwin, with, with this uh, William Paley saying the universe is like a gigantic watch, it has a design, therefore it has a designer. Along comes Darwin and shows through natural selection, through what we nowadays call evolution, that you can have design without a designer. Or as Richard Dawkins says, if there's a watchmaker, the watchmaker is blind. Now that is a big problem for a certain kind of Christian theology. But in Judaism, who ever thought of God as a watchmaker, as a designer? The person who thought of God as a watchmaker or a designer was Aristotle. Aristotle believed in teleological causes, in other words, that you can find by science evidence of purpose in nature. Jews never thought about God as a watchmaker. A matchmaker, maybe. <laughs> but a watchmaker, no. God in the Torah is not like a scientist or a mechanic. God in the Torah is exactly like a parent bringing new life into the world. In other words, what Darwin and the neo-Darwinists refuted was not the Jewish bit of Christianity, but the Greek bit of Christianity, the bit that Christianity got from Aristotle. But the Jewish bit remains completely untouched. And what difference does that make? This is the question I raise in the book. What do we stand to lose if the world loses Judaism and the Jewish dimension of Christianity? And the answer is a very great deal indeed. Let me ask you to do a thought experiment here. I'm going to, this is a difficult idea, so I have to give you a for instance. Tell me, are Americans, do Americans get excited about sport? <laughs> I suppose they do, don't they? baseball, basketball, football. Uh, the Brits get terribly excited about our particular version, which you call soccer, is that right? And we get very passionate about this. I will actually tell you a true story. Um, <laughs> one of the most extraordinary things that ever happened to me. In 1990, when I had been chosen but not yet appointed as chief rabbi, George Carey had been appoint chosen but not yet appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury, and somebody discovered that we both supported the same soccer team uh, called Arsenal. I don't know if you've heard of this team. Uh, you, no comments. We all have sins to atone for. <laughs> and, they, and, and this person who discovered it said, would you like your first ecumenical gathering to be in our box at Highbury Stadium? So I said, wonderful. The archbishop said, Vodemachaya, and we met at the stadium. <laughs> a midweek match for obvious religious reasons, and there it was, night match, under the floodlights, they took us down to meet the players, they took us out al Admat Kodesh on the holy ground of Arsenal turf itself, and the loudspeakers are saying, we have with us tonight the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Chief Rabbi, and you could hear the buzz go round the crowd, that whichever way you play the theological wager, that night Arsenal had friends in high places. <laughs> They could not possibly lose. 
Now, this is a true fact, and you can look it up in the records. That night, Arsenal went down to its worst home defeat in 63 years. They lost 6-2 at home to Manchester United. The next day, an English newspaper said, if the Ch Archbishop of Canterbury and the Chief Rabbi between them cannot bring, a win, bring about a win for Arsenal, does this not finally prove pu -pu -pu, that God does not exist? The next day, they carried my reply, which went as follows. No, it proves that God exists. It's just that he supports Manchester United. <laughs> anyway, now, Hebra, I want you to imagine the following. Suppose, you know, suddenly you, you've got an anthropologist from Mars, E.T., somebody, some extraterrestrial, and you take him to a baseball game, and he sees everyone jumping up and down in excitement, and he says, why does everyone get so excited? And in order, and in order to explain to this visitor from a foreign planet why people get so excited, you explain to him all the rules of baseball. Will he still understand? No, no way. You want to explain why people get so excited, you've got to talk about sport as ritualized conflict, you've got to do a little bit of anthropology, cultural history, etc., etc. And from this example, you can infer a general principle. Listen carefully. The meaning of a system lies outside the system. Are you with me? Try explaining, you know, what, what somebody is doing putting in a credit card in a cash machine. Are you with me? You will not be able to explain to a complete primitive who never saw this just by explaining the physical properties of the plastic in the machine. You'll have to explain barter, exchange, monetary value, the whole works. The meaning of a system lies outside the system. Therefore, the meaning of the universe lies outside the universe. And once we understand that sentence, we understand the absolute revolution that Avram Avinu brought into the world. It was, monotheism wasn't a simple bit of reducing many gods to one god. The revolution was, for the first time ever, people thought of God as not within the universe, but beyond the universe, transcending the universe, beyond nature, because he created nature. When I look at the heavens, the work of the, your fingers, Psalm 8, the heavens, the work of your fingers. God is beyond the universe. In other words, for the first time in history, people imagine something beyond the universe, giving meaning to the universe. For the first time in history, Judaism brought civilization, the idea that life has a meaning. Now, what was life like before it had a meaning. Let me tell you, the answer to that is very simple. What would life be like if the universe had no meaning? If the universe were blind to our existence, deaf to our prayers, indifferent to our fate? We know the answer to that. That is what the Greeks taught us. The Greeks gave us one of the greatest contributions of all. It is called tragedy. The tragedy of Oedipus, the tragedy of Antigone, the work of Sophocles and Aeschylus. In other words, it will all end in tears because all our hopes and dreams are destined to come crashing against the rocks of cruel indifference. That is the tragic view of life. Judaism is the principled defeat of tragedy in the name of hope. That is what Abraham brought into the world. Let me explain the word hope. People confuse two similar sounding ideas, optimism and hope. Let me tell you, they're not the same at all. Optimism is the belief that things are going to get better. Hope is the belief that if we work hard enough together, we can make things better. Optimism is a passive virtue, but hope is an active one. It takes no courage 
only a certain kind of naivety to be an optimist. But it takes a great deal of courage to have hope. No Jew, knowing what we do of history, can be an optimist. But no Jew who is really a Jew ever lost hope. Od lo avda tikvatenu. We never lose hope. And I have to tell you the very existence. Is it an accident that the state of Israel proclaimed a mere three years after the Jewish people stood eyeball to eyeball with the angel of death at Auschwitz, when the Jewish people said, Lo amut, ki echia, I will not die, but I will live. Is it any accident that this greatest affirmation in Jewish history of the last 2,000 years, that its national anthem should be Hatikva, the hope. Judaism is the voice of hope in the conversation of humankind. Secondly, so if we lose the Jewish element in faith, we will lose hope. The second thing we will lose is freedom. Let me tell you very simply that if science is all there is, and if we can give a complete scientific explanation for everything, including everything we do, then all human freedom is an illusion. And there are certain people, Sam Harris in America, who believe this, that free will is a complete illusion. I had uh, the Oxford neuroscientist, friend of Richard Dawkins, on my television program a couple of years ago, a hard determinist who believes you have no freedom. Colin, I said, if you really believe that, then why on earth do we have laws and courts and trials and the concept of responsibility and the idea of justice? Forget it all. If all human action is unfree, is genetically determined, then no one is ever responsible for their deeds and therefore don't punish pr criminals, just perform neurosurgery on them, sedate them with psychotropic drugs. And he couldn't give me any kind of answer to that. Therefore, if human freedom goes, the free society goes with it. Whereas Judaism insisted with every fiber of its being that we are free. Why? Because we are in the image of God, and God is free because He said, eh, yeah, I share, eh, yeah, I will be what I choose to be. And that is what it is to be human. We are what we choose to be, the ultimate statement of freedom. Those three words the Greeks couldn't understand. And Isaac Peshevis Singer was never more Jewish than when he said, we have to be free. We have no choice. So if we lose the Jewish element of faith, we will lose hope and we will lose freedom. And the third thing we will lose is the concept of human dignity. I, I have to tell you, looked at it from the perspective of science, what is human dignity? We are a mere concatenation of chemicals. We share 98% of our DNA with the primates. We have 20,000 genes so do earthworms, so do fruit flies. What happens to human dignity if science and our material being is all there is? The basis of human dignity is a religious basis and cannot be other than that. The fact that God made every one of us regardless of color or culture or creed in His image, thus endowing every one of us with non-negotiable, unconditional dignity. That's what Jews and Judaism gave the world. Number one, dignity. Number two, freedom. Number three, hope. And none of these is a scientific fact. Each one of them is a bedrock of our faith. And that is what remains. When all the science has been done and will be done, there will still be the three gifts Jews and Judaism gave to the world, freedom, dignity, and hope. And that is why we see religion and science not as enemies but as friends. We need both. As I put it in the book, science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts things together to see what they mean. And we need them both the way we need the two hemispheres of the brain. Faith answers the three questions that every reflective human being must ask himself or herself at some stage in life, the three questions science cannot answer. Who am I? Why am I here? How then shall I live? When all the science is in, 
We will still ask those questions, and we will still need faith to achieve the right answers. And I end, therefore, with the event that finally persuaded me to write the book. I don't know if you read about it in the States, but in 2009, the British Humanist Association, the group of, of uh, from atheists, um, <laughs> paid for London buses to carry a big advertisement saying, God probably doesn't exist. Did you read about this? They were on all our buses. And I thought, what an interesting word, probably. Let's see how far probability takes us. Item one, Britain's most distinguished scientist, Lord Rees, former president of the Royal Society, has shown how the entire structure of the universe is determined by six mathematical constants, gravity, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and so on which had to be so precisely tuned for there to be stars and planets and us that the probability of those six mathematical constants being exactly right is almost infinitesimally small. In other words, if probability were all that counted, the universe wouldn't exist. Secondly, the probability of the emergence of life from non-life. Do you know how improbable that is? Scientists have not a clue how it happened, and they may never have a clue how it happened. So improbable that Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, came up with a brilliant solution. How did life appear on Earth? Got here from Mars. Thank you very much, Francis Crick. <laughs> Exchanging one improbability for an even greater improbability. Or, number three, work this out. The universe, 13.7 billion light years across, a universe of 100 billion galaxies, each of 100 billion stars. There is among all that massive, almost infinite number of planets, of, of stars, only one planet known to us that gave rise to life. And here on Earth, among the three million life forms that exist on Earth, only one of them is capable of asking the question, why? How probable is that? So if probability ruled, there would be no universe, no life, and no us. And now ask how probable it is, is it that one man, Avram Avinu, who performed no miracles, who delivered, no promises, who led, no army, who ruled, no nation, should have become in the course of history overwhelmingly the most influential man who ever lived, claimed today as their spiritual ancestor by 2.2 billion Christians, 1.6 billion Muslims, and a few of us. <laughs> More than half of the seven billion people on this planet. How probable is it that one tiny people, us, smaller, you know, Milton Himmelfarb once said, think about it, the entire world population of jury is smaller than the statistical error in the Chinese census. <laughs> How probable is it that these tiny people were assaulted by some of the greatest empires the world has ever known, who bestrode the narrow world like a colossus, by the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Alexandrian Empire, the Roman Empire, medieval empires of Christianity and Islam, all the way through to the 20th century, the Third Reich and the Soviet Union, all of them seemingly invulnerable in their time, all of them have been consigned to history, and this tiny people can still stand and sing, Am um, Yisrael Chai. How probable is that? Friends, frankly, nothing remotely interesting is probable. And therefore, I suggested to the British Humanist Society, with all due deference, that they slightly amend their advertising slogan and said, instead of saying, God probably doesn't exist, it should read, Improbably, he does. 
And now, friends, we can say what Judaism was and is. Judaism is the defeat of probability by the power of possibility. Our ancestors, guided by God, dreamed of a better, more just, and gracious world. And by the sheer power of freedom, dignity, and hope, they helped and continued to help make it be. So it was. So may it always be. Amen.